Okay, I want to show you something over here with uh, Yehuda and Tamar. Um, uh, on page, uh, I want to go back there for a second, then we're going to go back to Yosef. So by Yehuda and Tamar, where Yehuda, Yehuda, marries, uh, Yehuda marries Tamar. Um, so, um, and by the way, is there a Gomorrah here? I need a Gomorrah Yuma. The Gomorrah. It's, on the, it's, it's Rosh Hashanah, so okay, there's three. Oh, three right. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, thank you. So Yehuda in Tamar over here, so what happens is, yeah, I'm just going back to the story for a second. On page 210, um, in, um, um, she gets, uh, 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 she entices Yehuda, we mentioned that yesterday, and then um, she takes three pieces of, uh, of uh, his personal belongings as a security uh, that she should uh, be able to identify. And she's gonna come into, it's going to come into play later. And then um, Yehuda goes looking for her because he wants to redeem his securities. So Yehuda goes looking. He says, where is the harlot that used to, that used to be here? And uh, uh, maybe I can ask everybody who's sitting here, maybe come sit at the table here. It just seems harder for me to keep turning. Um, the, uh, 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 and, and the people say, there was no harlot here. What harlot are you talking about? You know, she, she purposely, she did this. It was a one-off in order to get, uh, 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 to, 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 to live with Yehuda. And then on the top of page 212, at the end of three months, Yehuda Lemar, Yehuda is told, Zansa Tamar Kalasecha. Tamar, your, your daughter, your former daughter in law, has uh, committed uh, 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 immorality. She's pregnant. That's why it takes three months. It takes three months to see the pregnant. Yehuda says, Take her out and burn her. Now, there are, it wasn't Yehuda alone, it was Yehuda and his Bezdin, and there are different opinions who was on the Bezdin. There's one opinion in the Medrash that the Bezdin was made up of Ye- Yaakov, Yitzchak, Yehuda, and the Shvatim. There was all the Bezdin in those days. Then there's a whole discussion, if they kept Torah law, how could the Bezdin judge somebody who was a relative? There's a whole discussion among the commentators, the technical aspect of it. The point is that Yehuda goes, and he says, she sentenced her to death. So Rashi brings down, why, why? I mean, she she was essentially a single person. Why should she be? Why should she be burned to be burned to death? So Rashi says, um, "Vitisarev." Um, it's the fifth line from the top in the right column of Rashi. Amar Ephraim Miksha Mishum Rebbe Meir, Tanaic stores. Bito Shel Shem Haisa Shehu Koin. She was the daughter of Shem, who was a Koin. Who Koin the Kelelio. Lefichach Danua Bisreifa. Therefore, she got. A burning. That's the halacha in the Torah that the daughter of a kohen, bas kohen ki heitzeichaliznos. The Torah says that she gets the burning penalty instead of the skila penalty or the or the or the strangulation penalty that a married woman normally gets. Now, a uh, uh, sorry, the strangulation penalty. Now, burning burning in Torah law does not mean a fire. Uh, how do you, what was the punishment? The capital. There are four capital punishments: skila, strafa, herigid, chanek. How did they do strafa? How did they do strafa? They took a piece of uh, Molten, uh, something, third piece of, uh, uh, of uh, um, not, not iron, uh, what's it called? Lead. Lead, and they melt, they dissolved it. The, the, they, they burnt the lead, they was the lead, lead when it's dissolved. And then they actually pour it down the, person, the person's throat. Smoke. Yeah, no, that's very bad. Yeah, yeah, very bad. They probably, they probably could have used that. Remember the Alka-Seltzer commercials? They used to have Alka-Seltzer commercials, so real bad heartburn. You know, they would, they, when you have high, you know, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. You never heard that that was the Alka-Seltzer Alka commercial, you know, a plop, plop, fizz, fizz, because you put it in a fizz, oh, oh, what a relief it is. And then they would show you, they would show you some guy who's suffering, you know, he's eating a, he's eating like a, a like a hoagie or something, and next thing you know, the guy's got heartburn, and then plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. So they used to sing that in, in Wrigley Field when Bruce Souter would come in to pitch because he was the relief pitcher for the Cubs and his good. And they would sing, they would sing the Elk of the Plop, Plop, Fizz, Fizz. <laughs> that was the, so, so I was like, I remember thinking that they could, this could have been used for an Elk of That's what burning is. Now, over here, I want to tell you, take, I'm going to take a little, uh, a little signs of a misspent youth. Uh, I'm going to, I want to take you on a little ride over here. 
there are commentaries that say that he wasn't sentencing her to death, which is difficult to understand because we're going to see later on that the, the Midrashim say that, that, that she was ready to die rather than embarrass him. Uh, there, there is a, so it's hard to understand these commentaries. What these commentaries say is, in the old days, a woman who was immoral, and not only in Torah society, in, 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 in Gentile society as well, they would actually burn her forehead. They would, they would, they would brand her on the forehead, uh, which branded her as heavy, and I think it was more for the point of disfiguring her than anything. Now, you're not going to believe this, you're not going to believe this, but there's brought down in Shulchan Aruch, there was actually an incident that the, the Chuvas Harosh says, there was a Jewish woman who married a non-Jew. A Jewish woman committed adultery with a non-Jew, and the Bazdin severed her nose and her ears. How do you like that, Borach? That got your attention there, yeah. The basin, the basin severed, uh, severed her nose. When, uh, uh, for, now I once saw, I once there was a guy in France, cut off. Yeah. Uh, why? What did you think severed meant? They, they spread honey on it? No, no, no. <laughs> severed, severed, severed means they, 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 they removed it. And the, uh, uh, I once saw a picture. There was years ago. There was an incident in France. There was a guy who opened up a letter bomb. Somebody sent some guy in France a letter bomb. And nothing to do with her, just so he's out for whatever reason. And it, it, blew, it blew up and it, and it severed his nose. It blew off his nose. They had a picture of the guy, and without a nose, the person looks terrible. Yeah. Just without, with, without a nose, the person looks like, just like an outer space creature. So they, they, they you know, they, and that was efficient. And there are other post skim who say, no, we don't do that. Yeah, like, but there was an incident where it was done, where the Tosin Shuas Harash brings, they were going back to the. Uh, probably the 13th century, I think we're around the 13th century, where a woman does not behaving properly, and then they put a stop to it. So there are those that say that that's what Yehuda meant over here, that Yehuda was saying, take her out and burn her, meaning to brand her, right, as a, as, as a harlot. However, the plain meaning here is that he was sentencing her to death. Now, look what happens over here. So Yehuda says, it says, Vayomer Yehuda hotziu v'tisoref. He mutzes, she was being taken out. Vihi sholcha el chameha, she sent to her father in law, Lamar. Laish asher elelo anochi hara. The man who these items belong to, he's the father. She wouldn't name him. She just said to the judge, Yehud is the lead judge on the Beisdin, these are the items that belong to the father, to the man who impregnated me. Please recognize them. She's right. It was from me. Yehuda admits in public that he's the father. Now, you got to put this in the proper perspective. You got the Av Beisdin, you got the head of the Beisdin, who all of a sudden stands up and says, Yes, I'm the father named in the paternity suit. This is an extremely, extremely embarrassing uh, public confession. You asked yesterday, why did the kingdom come from Yehuda? Miguel, you asked that, right? The answer is, he rules over himself. If you could rule over yourself, you could rule over others. To rule over others is not hard. To be a dictator, to just threaten people and kill people and be, you know, get the army behind, that's not hard. How about ruling over yourself? Now, that's tough. That's tough. The person who's able to rule over, that's the person who's suitable for the king. And that's why we find another king in the Jewish people, which is who? Yosef. Yosef is also going to be a ruler. Why does Yosef become a ruler? Because he rules over himself. And therefore, that's where Yehuda, Yehuda admits it. Now, we learn a halacha from Chad. This is also actually brought down. The Gemara says, better to allow yourself to be thrown into a fire than to embarrass somebody in public. Where do we learn that from? We learn it from Tamar. That she was willing to go into the fire because she was willing to die, not to name Yehuda. If, he's, if he'll admit, he'll admit, I'm not going to embarrass him in public. Can you imagine? So we learn from here, from Tamar, better. Now, I want to ask you a question. Let's say you open up a Gemara. It's a statement in the Gemara. The Gemara says, better to allow yourself to be thrown into a fire than to embarrass somebody in public. Is that a Musser concept? to tell you how bad it is to embarrass people in public? Or is it a halacha? That if it's a, that if it's, that if you have a chance to pull the chair out from somebody and everybody's gonna laugh when he rolls around on the floor, 
which Mickey Mantle used to do to his wife. You didn't know that, did you? Right? Mickey Mantle would go to a restaurant with the Yankees with Billy Martin and Wadey Ford and these other guys, and his wife Marilyn would come along, and she'd go to see, he'd hold the chair for her, and he would pull the chair out, and she would go plopping on the floor. Right? And they would all just laugh. Could you imagine a woman, what a woman feels like when that happens? Her whole husband does that to her. Now, I, I, my, I, yeah, I'll tell you, if it happened once, okay, what should she say? She didn't know. It happened a second time. You know, by the third time, you should have picked up a pattern, lady. You know, your alcoholic husband is, is going to be pulling a is going to be pulling a chair. Mickey Mantle was an alcoholic. Did you know that? Yeah, he died of he died of liver disease. He was an alcoholic, and they did Sports Illustrated did a whole write up on him. The American hero, Mickey Mantle, won a triple crown in 1956. <laughs> yeah, he had hit 330, 52 home runs. Sorry, he had 353, 130 RBIs, 52 home runs. That's a fact. Look it up. And he's the American hero, Mickey Mantle, right? He said later on, his whole career, he was an alcoholic. They even asked him, what did you drink? Whiskey, wine? He said, didn't matter. So as long as there's a bottle on it, it didn't matter quality, quantity, it didn't matter. Half the time he went up to bat, he was hungover, right? So, 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 so you know, it happened once, twice. I, by a third time, lady, you should have picked up a pattern. So you say it's a Musser idea. Most agree that it's a Musser idea. You know how bad it is to embarrass somebody in public? Better to let yourself be thrown into a fire. There are poskim that say it's a halacha. That a person has to give up his life and not embarrass somebody in public. Is it embarrassment is akin to death? Probably. Embarrassment is akin to death. The reason embarrassment is, called, is akin to death is that when a person is embarrassed, the Gemara says, when a person is embarrassed, the red, the, the azal, azal chum sumka, asa chivra. The, the red is, the blood goes, and the white comes to, you've drained his blood. Now, we normally associate, when you're embarrassed, what do you associate? If somebody's embarrassed, what happens to them? They get, they flush, they turn, they turn red, you don't drain red. So, so the, 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 the fortune explained, at the instant of embarrassment, the blood drains from a face. Then it rushes back into the face, that's why a person turns red. The red is, the re, is, is really the rebound effect. That the, that the person, when he's embarrassed, there's like, you know, the, 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 that moment that he turns white. In an instant, the blood is drained, so you've spilled his blood. That's why it's aching to death. And therefore, a person, any, a person, anybody who's ever experienced embarrassment knows that the moment that a person is embarrassed, sometimes you'd rather the earth just open up and swallow you up. That's most, the, the, the most, what do you call it? And women have a greater sensitivity to embarrassment than men do. Women can be embarrassed about anything, you know, anything. I'm so embarrassed. The napkins are not the right color. I'm so embarrassed. You know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, lady, don't get swallowed up until you bring out the main course. Then, uh, then we don't care. You know, just, just, we just wait. The, the women are very, very sensitive to that sort of thing. Women are very sensitive. So, 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 so there are those that say it's actually a halacha. Now, what happens is Yudah goes in and confesses. Yudah admits in public. That's why later on there's a confrontation between Yudah and Yosef when we get the part of Vayigash. It's the meeting of the two kings, Yehuda and Yosef. Why are they kings? Because they rule over themselves. That's the definition of a king. To get my kids to do what I want is not hard. Get your kids to do what you want is not hard because you're bigger than them. Like Lucy once said to Linus, Lucy, the peanut strip? And the peanuts, do you remember the peanut strip? Oh, guys, come on, tell me you didn't do that either. The, the famous Charlie Brown peanut strip. Oh, yeah. yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. So, 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 so Lucy is the tough older sister, and Linus is the little brother. And Linus gets her ticked off at some point. And Lucy looks at Linus, she says, she, 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 she says, you know how to knock your block off. That was her famous line. But for some reason, she says, Linus appeals to her. He says, listen, you're bigger than me, stronger than me, and faster than me. In matters like this, I'm at your mercy. And so you see her thinking about it, and she puts her fist down and walks away. And then Linus says, you see, a little diplomacy always helps. You know? But you're, to get your kids, to tell your kids, what, to get your kids what to do, yeah, you listen, you're stronger, you run the show, you carry the money, you got everything, the father's in control. That's not training the kids. Hey, get your kids, get, get weaker people to do what you want them to do. That's never hard. Just threaten them. That's not a problem. But get ourselves to do what we're supposed to do. That's a person who rules over, over himself. That's the, that's a, that's a, that's Azu Gibor. The Mishnah in Pirkei says, Azu Gibor, who's considered strong? Some gorilla who can lift 400 pounds because he's been pumping steroids, right? Oh, look at him, you know, wow, oh, he's strong. 
Ezel Gibar HaMoshel B'Yitzra, one who rules over his inclination. That's a strong person. A person who could control himself, that's a strong person. That's real, that's real strength. Much harder than lifting weights. Much harder. His real strength is to overcome. Much, much a bigger challenge. So Yehuda shows ten, the king tendencies over here. He is a king. He admits and he marries her. And there are two opinions whether they, it says, Velo Yosef Odli Data means he no longer lived with her, or it means he, he no longer, he, he didn't stop living with her. That means he took her as a wife, she gets pregnant, she has twins, and the Davidic dynasty comes from here. So who did Yehuda save from the fire? He essentially saved three people. He saved Tamar, and she was already pregnant with twins. So he saved three people. Mida Kineged Mida, God pays back, where you, got, you get what you deserve. Later in history, three descendants of Yehuda will be saved from a fire. Who are they? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who get thrown into the fire by King Nebuchadnezzar. They are descendants of Yehuda. They are saved from that fire, at least partially in the merit of Yehuda, who saved three souls right now. Therefore, they are saved later on in history. They get out, they get out of the fire. Let's go to Yosef. So Yosef is admitted. We started Mrs. Potiphar yesterday. And if you take a look, four lines to the bottom on 214. He didn't obey her. Yosef would not have anything to do with her. She threatened him. She cajoled him. She tempted him. And it says in the Medrash, it went on for a year. An entire year he had to go through, he had to, he had to go through this. And it was at the point that he was ready to break. In other words, as long as you've got the energy, you've got to work it through. At the point he's ready to break, God gets involved. He says, I'm going to help you out. And he sees the image of his father. He sees the image. The Medrash says that he was ready, he was ready, to, commit to, he was ready to commit to sin, and Yosef wouldn't commit to sin. Now, if you take a look, Rashi says, where is it? On uh, Pasuk Yud Aleph. I'm going to show you something really incredible. Back on 214. Everybody see it? 214, two lines from the bottom. Perak Lamed Tes, Pasuk Yud Aleph. Vahikya Yom Azev, Vayoha Baisalasos Melachto. He came home to do his work. And there's an opinion in the Gemar that he was intending to sin. There was nobody there in the house with him. Take a look at Rashi. Left column, two lines from the bottom. Lasos Melachto, Rav Shmuel. Machlokas in the Gemara, Rav and Shmuel. What does it mean he came home to do his, to do his work, to do the job? Machlokas in the Gemara. Chad Amar Melachto Mamish. One came, he came home to do, he had housework to do. He was the guy running the house there. Vichad Amar Lasos Shrochavima. One says, one opinion is he came home to sin with her. So what stopped him? At the two, two, page 214, last line, left column, Rashi, left, bottom line. What stopped him? He saw the image of his father. His father's image appeared to him. So Yaakov, Yosef's about to do the, the Avera, and Yaakov's image appears to him. And Yaakov says to Yosef, listen, in the future, your brother's names are going to be written on the Kohen Godel's chest plate. Do you want your name on the chest plate or do you want your name registered for posterity that you're a guy who visits with harlots? And so Yosef backed off. Yosef backed off. Okay, now, turn back for a second. Turn back for a second to Yaakov when the brothers come to come, when the brothers show him the, what do you call it? Um, on page 206. Keep the finger on the place on 214. Go back to page 206 for a second. And you'll notice on page 206, four lines from the bottom, five lines from the bottom. <coughs> His kids got up to comfort him. He refuses to be comforted. So the Mephorshim say, what does it mean he refuses to be comforted? So there is a number of Mephorshim. It's brought down in several sources. Yaakov felt that by refusing to be comforted, he maintains some sort of connection with Yosef. 
Once he's comforted and he accepts it as a fait accompli, then that severs the bond between him and Yosef. He refuses to be comforted, so at some spiritual level, he maintains some sort of supervision, control, slash control over Yosef. Back to 2.14. What is the first word Yosef says to her? Look at the word that Yosef says on Pesach Ches, when she's trying to tempt him, on page 2.14, eight lines from the bottom. What did we say yesterday? What does he say? What's the word? Vayimayin. Same word that Yaakov uses, that's used by Yaakov when he refuses to be comforted. Vayimayin. That's the connection. Where does Yosef get the strength of Vayimayin? Because Yaakov was Vayimayin. It's the exact same word. He maintains the connection. He maintains the connection. Okay? Now, Vayimayin. Yaakov says Vayimayin. Yosef says Vayimayin. That's the spiritual connection that gives Yosef the strength. Okay? Now, can't ask any questions about that, Miguel. Very simple question. Yeah, go ahead. Why doesn't it have the same problem? That I don't know. That I don't know. What does that mean? Could be it was harder for Yosef. What does what mean? What is, yeah. Baruch, what does what mean? He refuses. He refuses to be comforted, and over here Yosef refuses to be tempted. I would guess, I would guess that the, that the reason it doesn't have the same, the same squiggly over it is by Yaakov, is just very quickly, Vayimayin. I think by Yosef, there's an invitation over here that this is a hard refusal. It's a difficult refusal over here. You know where else we find this? We find that same trap by, by Lot. When Lot is leaving, look, look at, look, go, go back to Parsha's Vayera. Go back. From when he's leaving Stom. So what's the word? I forgot the, I forgot the word. But when, when Lot is leaving, on page um, uh, 86. Yeah, on page 86. Four lines, five lines from the bottom. So the, the angels say to Lot, take your wife and your daughters and get out. Which means, page 86, five lines from the bottom. 86, five lines from the bottom. Paracute test, post test, which means you got to leave all your possessions behind. You're a wealthy man. You're about to abandon everything. So look at what it says over there. Uh, how does he translate? He lingered. Look at the vayis mama. Yeah, Lord linger. That's a difficult decision to make. I got to run away from here and leave everything behind. All my wealth. Not an easy thing to do. That's what that shall show it is over here. So now go on page two fourteen. This idea that Yaakov appears to him. At the last moment, where Yosef is breaking, all of a sudden the image of his father. Now listen, watch this. Ready for a ride, Mayor? You're going to love this. Ready? There's a halacha that if a Jewish man, and this we find in Parshas Pinchas, when Zimri was consorting, when, 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 when uh, Zimri was consorting with Cosby, the Midianite woman. So Pinchas comes to Moshe Rabbeinu, and he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, didn't you teach us that if a Jewish man is consorting with a non-Jewish woman, vigilante action is permissible. You're allowed to take the law in your own hands. Kanoim pogimbo. Kanoim pogimbo. A, 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 somebody who's, who's truly zealous can go out there and yell, Shabbos! That's if you're really bothered by Shabbos. To go out and yell Shabbos because it's a lot more fun than going to the base of Edith. Then you can't go out in the street and yell Shabbos at cars. But if you're just burning for the honor of Shabbos and you're, you want to make a protest in God's honor, you could do that. I personally would rather take a nap on Shabbos afternoon, but, you know, it's up to you. But you got to be 100% for Shabbos, not because, oh, we like some action. Then you're disqualified. If you're really upset about Shabbos, then you have a right to go yell Shabbos. The same way that if somebody would walk through your neighborhood, somebody would walk through a from neighborhood in a bathing suit. A woman would walk through a from neighborhood, do you think you'd go out there and say, hey, get that out of here, my kids are here, because you're really bothered by it. And you understand you have that right. You understand that you have it. They're violating you. So a person who really cares about Shabbos, and Shabbos is your queen, Shabbos is something you care about, so you have a right to, hey, listen, you're violating us. And you're, but that's only if you're 100%. If you're 99% to stay home, eat, eat another helping of chult, knock down some Jack Daniels and go take a long nap, right? Get, get, get yourself, keep yourself out of trouble, right? If you're a Shlomo Zaman Arbach who did yell Shabbos, yeah, how do you like that? 
and I know this personally. You know how I know this? I'll tell you a story. You want to hear a story? I'll tell you a story. They once had a, uh, there was once a, uh, um, there was a girl who I read in a book. There was a girl who was, didn't have much family, and Rosh Hashanah kind of adopted her. And he raised her, and he got her married off. He made a shit up for her, he paid for her wedding. Right after the chuppah, right after the chuppah, the chassan and kala go off into the yichud room, and Rosh Hashanah, one of the gedol Ador, there were 300,000 people at his levaya. I was at his levaya, 300,000 people. There was a secular cop at the levaya who said, he was quoted as saying, if I knew I'd have 300,000 people at my funeral, I would drop dead right now. Right? It was unbelievable. And he was an unbelievable person. And Rosh Hashanah, right after the chuppah, this girl that he'd raised, an orphan girl, he told the witnesses outside the room, just one second, I want to go in for one second. He knocked on the door, went into the yichud room, and he said to this young lady, that's the last time I see you wearing a shetel like that. And he left. That was a story that I read and documented that Rosh Hashanah said that. There was a gathering at, uh, at Binyaneha Oma. I don't know if you've been Oma. You know where Binyaneha Oma is? The big, the big auditorium in Yerushalayim. They have the annual Lashon Hara gathering. There are probably 1,500 women there, 2,000. It was a massive, massive audience. So I spoke at this gathering, and I told this story. For whatever the context was, I told this story about Rosh Hashanah and whatever the context was of the story. Okay, that night I get home. It finished at 9 o'clock. I get home. At about 10 o'clock at night, 10.30 at night, I get a phone call. It's Rishoma Zalman Arbach's daughter-in-law, Rabbi Kaplan. How could you tell a story like that about Rishoma? Do you really think Rishoma Zalman would talk like that? Do you think he ever spoke like that? And that he would say something like that to a girl at her wedding? That's why she was very upset. It was his daughter. So I, you know, I, I looked up the story, and I called her back. I said, this story was told over, it's recorded in a, in a safer. And the story, the source of the story, I call the author of the book. The book is a book of Reb, what a Reb Zilverstein, the guy who wrote the books on Rabbi Yitzhak Zilverstein. I called up the author of the book. I said, where did you get the story from? He said he heard it on a tape from Rosh Hashanah Shadron in front of 200 people. Rosh Hashanah Shadron was Rosh Hashanah Zangman Arbach's brother-in-law. And he told the story in front of 200 people. So I said to the late, I called her up. I said, you know, it's a, I, it, the source of the story is his brother-in-law. He said it in public. It's in the book in public. I'm not publicizing it. This is a well-known story. She said, do you really think Rosh Zaman Arba was speaking? Like, okay. Yes. Ad Khan Hakafa Aleph, right? We, okay. I decided, listen, I don't want her to be upset. The next day, I looked up, she's married to one of Rosh Zaman Arba's sons. She's from England, she speaks English. She's, she's married to one of his sons. They're all Talmud Chacham, massive Talmud Chacham. So I go over, I knock on the door. They live in, I think, Gushmonim. I knock on the door. They open the door, oh, Shalom Aleichem, come on in. She rags, I come on in, I sit down. And I sit down with her and her husband at the table. I said, I just want to apologize. I meant to get you upset that, you know. She said to me again, she goes, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman that would never speak like that. So her, his son turns to her. He goes, oh, that's not true. I was once walking with him on Shabbos, and a car drove by, and he yelled, Shabbos! <laughs> I was so happy. The joy, the joy of victory, the agony of defeat. And she turns around, she goes, he, didn't, he couldn't have hit it. He goes, no, no, he did. He was, he was laughing. I was laughing. She was so upset. I, I read that. No, yeah, well, yeah, I got, out, I got out of there before it went any further. The joy of victory, the agony of defeat. <laughs> they used to have that in the wide, wide world of sports. It would start with a skier going off a cliff somewhere. The, the joy of victory, the agony of defeat, the guy wiping out. So, 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 so in any event, kanoim pogimbo means that if you're really zealous for God, that's what, that's what Pinchas said to Moshe Rabbeinu, didn't you teach us that if a Jewish man is committing adultery with a non-Jewish woman, so kanoim pogimbo, he would get struck down? He said, yes. Yes, okay, that's kanoim pogimbo. Yaakov appears to Yosef. Mayor, my friend, what's the gematria of Yaakov? 182. What's that? 182. 182 is the gematria of Yaakov. He does that very quick, if you've noticed. 182. Kanoim pogim bo. The first three letters are kuf, is 100. Pogim is pei, is 80. And bo is 2. 
What does Yosef see when he sees Yaakov Avinu? He sees 182, which is a reminder to Yosef of Kanoim Pogimbo. What's he about to do? A Jewish man consorting with a non-Jewish woman. Kanoim Pogimbo. So Yosef backs off. Yosef sees not only the image of Yaakov Avinu, but what Yaakov Avinu is a reminder of Kanoim Pogimbo. So Yosef backs off. Now, Yosef gets tossed into prison, okay? And Yosef, in prison, enchants everybody. Everywhere he goes, he every, he's, enchants everybody. Now, I want to ask you a question. How would you feel right now if you were Yosef? How would you feel? You're, yeah, darn right you'd be upset. You know, it's one thing your brother sold you. That happens sometimes. <laughs> you know, certainly with girls. Yeah, that happens sometimes. If, if, if your brothers sell you, kidnap you and sell you, okay, not too often, hopefully, but, it, you know, you're upset as it is. And here I was trying to do the right thing. I told my father that they're doing what I perceived as a virus. I had all the right intentions, and I get sold. So, yeah, that's a downer. Okay, you end up by, you end up by Potiphar. And when you're by Potiphar, what happens? You go and resist you serve God at the highest level that anyone's ever served God, any male's ever served. You risk for a year, you resist, and what's your, what's your, what do you get for it? You get tossed into an Egyptian pit. And prison in those days wasn't like prison today. It's called a bore. It's called a pit, right? It's not like prison today where you get cable and you can get to do a college degree and you write your memoirs like Charles Manson and you, and you, and you sell it and you become a millionaire, right? That's how what prison was. But you're in an Egyptian pit. If you were Yosef, you'd be pretty down, right? Take a look what happens. He's in the, he's in the what do you call it? And uh, uh, um, um, uh, it says, Bottom of page 216. The, the, the butler and the baker messed up. Some say they were the, it was them personally. Some say they were the head butler, the guys in charge of all the wine, the wine and the guy in charge of all the, all the baker, whatever it was. Paro gets upset. So what do you do? A capital offense. You go to prison for getting. You go to prison for messing up the kids, the king's pastries, right? Yeah, yeah. A fly was there. Was a fly. The, the measure said there was a fly in the wine, and there was a stone in one of the one of the one of the, one of the pastries, right? A fly got. It. So we're going to find out later that that well, the fly is really not your fault. You know, you could be transferring the cup, and a fly could fall in. That's really not your fault. Whereas a stone, that's carelessness. You know, if you're baking, there should not be any stones, nothing, anything, any power breaking a tooth is not a good thing, right? And, you know, you know, so in those cases, they get tossed into prison. Okay. And then they have a dream. And look at this. Now let's take a look. Puzzle Vav. Vayovo Aleim Yosef Baboker. Yosef shows up in the morning. Vayaro Samvine Zoamfim. They look, uh, they look kind of, uh, 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 they're, they're rattled. How does he translate it? Aggrieved. Aggrieved. Why in such a bad mood? I want to ask you a question. You know, nobody likes a gun snapper in the morning. That I could tell you, right? I mean, you know, if I was one of them, and this Jewish kid comes over and he says, hey, guys, why are you in such a bad mood this morning? And then Jimmy, I was like, what do you got, kid? You know, well, you're in such a good mood. What? Why you have plans for today? What, what are you in such a good mood about? You know, well, yeah, yeah. And they're aggrieved. So that shows you Yosef's level of trust. That Yosef has not lost his trust in God. And that's what we always speak about. What's bitachon? Bitachon is whatever's happening is for the best. I don't understand this. I went the extra. I went the extra mile for God. I, I walked away from the temptation. I deserve, I deserve a medal, and instead I get tossed into prison. Any normal person, any normal person under the circumstances, like, what? What's going on here? And Yosef maintains the same Yosef, the same Yosef all the way through. We don't find the change in Yosef, not now, and not when he becomes a king. His level of trust in God is such, this is, this is all for the best, right? This is, this is what's supposed to be. So he asked them for his, what do you call it? You know, why, why are you guys so upset? So they tell him the dreams. Now I want to show you something. You know, the dreams are just not that difficult to interpret. 
Yeah, I was like, profound. Wow, what a dream interpreter. And we'll see next week's part with Paro also. What a dream interpreter. Take a look at this. So the guy says to him, uh, they said, we had dreams. Yosef said, you know, God, God interprets dreams. Tell me what you dreamt. So in Pesach test, Vaisaper Saramashki Meschalomo Lo Yosef, Veomer Lo Bechalomo Bechalomi Vine Gefen Lefonai. There's a vine in front of me. Now this is the butler having a dream about a vine. Uva Gefen Shlosha Sarigim. The vine has three, what are they translated? Clusters? Tendrils, I guess, branches. Vika Porachas also Nitsa Yishula Acharesa Amnai. And it's all ripened grapes. So I have a dream that there are three that there are three vines, three rich vines of grapes. The kos paro biyadi. I'm holding car, paro's cup in my hand. And I squeeze the grapes into the cup. And I gave it the paro to drink. Gee, I wonder what the interpretation is for that. I took grapes. I'm holding Paro's cup. I squoze grapes, squoze, I guess that's a word. I squeezed, squoze. I squeezed the grapes into the cup and I put it in Paro's hand. And there's a number three lurking here because there are three branches. Gee, that's a, that's a, ooh, I wonder what that could mean. Uh, uh, I guess you're, uh, uh, I guess you're going to be in a submarine soon, uh, you know, headed for, headed for Argentina, right? So what does Yosef say? Vayomer Yosef, Zepi Throno. Shloshes asarigim, shloshes amen. The three branches represents three days. Ooh, what a shot. Behold, shloshes yamim, isa paras was shechad. Three days, paras going to take you, re, re, restate, reinstate you. Veshivcha akanecha, vinasata kos paro yara, and you're going to be making grapes, what, wine for paro. I mean, I, I got news for you. Uh, you know, as far as a, a stab in the dark, I mean, that's, we would probably go in this direction with it without knowing the first thing about dream interpretation, right? And, 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 and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna give him the drink. Then he says, just do me a favor and remember you. Here's Yosef steps out of line. Just remember me when he does this good. Just remind me to paro. Remember me to Paro, so he takes me out of here. And Yosef gives him the whole Megillah that I was kidnapped and so on and so forth. So then the baker, second line on page 220, the Sar the Sarof is, ooh, the kid's good. How'd the baker know? How did the baker know that Yosef's interpretation for the butler was good? It hasn't happened yet. The answer is each one dreamt the other one's interpretation. But they didn't know it. They couldn't remember. It's like trying to remember somebody's name. What's this guy's name? So he says to you, uh, Mike. Oh, no, no, that's not it. No, no, I, 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 no, no. Uh, Steve. No, no, that's not it. No, so. Zalman. Yeah, right. Oh, right, right. And when you hear it, you know it. It's like you ever try to remember a tune? That's one of the most annoying things in life because people around you start singing. I'm trying to remember this too, and the guy goes, oh, is it da 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 No, 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 da 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 No, no, stop, stop, stop. Just, just, I don't talk about it. And then when you finally hear the tune, usually nobody gets it around you. It's usually you're in your car, and as you're getting out of your car, all of a sudden you hear it on the radio. Yeah, that's it. I've been waiting to hear that. Right? But you recognize it. So he, they, he dreamt it, but he didn't know he dreamt it. And then he hears it, he recognizes it. So then Yosef turns, he says, okay, listen to mine. And he has this dream about loaves of bread and birds are pecking away at the bread. No sign of Paro here. No sign of anything. And Yosef says to him, yeah, in three days Paro is going to take you out and you're going to get hung and the birds are going to eat your flesh. And then it happens. Three days later, Paro has a birthday. And by the way, the number three is probably the number three that Yosef guessed for the butler. I imagine there were announcements in, going around in Egypt. You know, Paro's birthday was a big day. And I imagine there were loudspeakers all over Egypt. Hear ye, hear ye, three days left for the kings of celebrate. Hear ye, hear ye. So everybody's got the number three ringing in their head with his birthday. So he says, oh, three. Oh, it's his birthday in three days. <laughs> what a shot. So you see, sometimes the miracle isn't what, what he sees. The miracle is what they don't see. The miracle is everybody else around you is blinded. The same thing is going to be in the next week's partial where Paro, Paro dreams about seven cows. Seven cows and seven, seven stalks of wheat. Heavy cows we are swallowed by, you know, so they guess, they, they call them the interpreters. 
They'll one say, oh, you're going to have seven daughters and they're going to die. I wouldn't say that to King of Dreams about cows, you know. You know, the seven daughters of God. Someone says you're going to conquer seven nations, they're going to rebel against you. Then, you. then Yosef says, it has to do with food. Well, considering that cows and grain are the most basic food staples there are, yeah, wow, profound, the kid's good. Now, the answer is that everybody else was, was blinded. That's the real miracle over here. So he takes them out of prison. So now the commentaries ask, and it happens, and then the Torah ends with, He didn't remember Yosef, he forgot him. Yosef gets another two years in prison because of this. What did Yosef do wrong here? So first of all, the commentaries ask, why do you need the second dream? Why did he even need the dream for the baker? Nothing happened with the baker. All that happened was the baker got killed. So why does he need the dream for the baker? What, what, what benefit is there in having the baker's dream? Anybody got an answer for that? It's a very good answer. What's the, what's the benefit of the baker's dream? The answer is that the butler may have thought to himself, all right, he took a shot in the dark. Took a stab. Kid took a stab. Took a shot in the dark. He happened to get lucky. No big deal. But if Yosef is willing to look at a guy in prison, he says, oh, by the way, in three days you're dead. I mean, you don't say that to somebody. If you have it. That's not a smart thing to say when you're a, when you're a visitor in the prison. You're, you know, this, who knows what the guy's going to react. He sees that Yosef's not intimidated by anything, that he speaks truth. So he sees it wasn't an accident. And when that happens to the, to the baker, gets hung, he says, yes, yeah, so he actually knew what was going to happen. And then Yosef ends up in prison. Now take a look at, take a look at the last Rashi. Last Rashi on page 220, left column. He didn't remember him on the day he got out, and he forgot about him afterwards. Why? Because Yosef depended on him to remember him. He had to be in prison another two years. Fortunate man who trusts in God. He didn't trust the Egyptian. So everybody asks over here, what did Yosef do wrong? We're supposed to make you shtadlus. Right? What's wrong with asking the guy to remember you? He's getting out of prison. What's asking him to remember you? So there are several answers. One answer is that the one that I, I an answer that doesn't sit with me so well. Yosef is supposed to be on such a high level that he has full bitachon. You know, the Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they earned their livelihood. They were all shepherds. They worked for their livelihood. What's wrong with Ishtadlus? What's wrong with making an effort? The answer is there's nothing wrong with making an effort but not if it's desperation. If you're in prison and there's a Palestinian guerrilla in prison with you and he happens to be getting out of prison, a Hamas guy is with you in prison and you say to the guy, and you happen to interpret his dream, you say, hey, do me a favor, Walid. When you get out of prison, do me a favor, may put in a good word for me. That's not responsible. That's desperate. What, do you really think there's a chance he's going to put in a good word for you? That's a desperation. Desperation, you've crossed line. That means your bitachon is too loose. Desperation, I told you the Chazanish had a guy in town. Remember I told you the guy, the Chazanish was from Kosovo, a place called Kosovo. There was an eccentric, an eccentric how's the word? Ex, what's the word? Eccentric. eccentric. Oh, I got it. I nailed that one. There's an eccentric Jew living in Kosovo, used to walk around with glasses frames but no lenses. Herschel the eccentric. And somebody once came up and said, Herschel, you know, if there are no lenses... It doesn't, it doesn't help you see better. I said, yeah, but it can't hurt. Yeah, you're, you're probably right, it can't hurt. You're right, it can't hurt. But it can hurt. You know why it hurts? It shows you don't trust God, because you're doing things that are desperate. Trust God. Do with the responsible thing. Sometimes guys are on Shaduchim. So you, you, you like to you call Say, so you're in the central bus station and you happen to see on one of the stalls in the bathroom a Shadchan's, for, for, a Shadchan's phone number. That's desperation. How good, could that, how good is that going to be? You're walking through a park. On the park bench, they have a sticker for a Shadchan on the park bench. That, that, that's desperation. 
And Yosef's level, that's desperation. What are you relying on an Egyptian? You think he's going to help you? You cross the line over there. That's one answer. I heard a better answer. I don't have a source for this. It's the best answer I ever heard. Because we have to ask another question. Why two more years? Why two more years? Why two years in prison? Do you remember the spies go into the land? 40 days. What did the Jewish people get? 40 years. So we see that God punishes a year per day. A year per day. That's the punishment. So that's the rate of punishment. When you mess up at that level, apparently, the rate of payment is a year for a day. So I saw one of the commentaries says, when did Yosef appeal to this guy? He appealed right after he interpreted his dream. He interpreted his dream and said, by the way, when you get out, remember me. That's three days before he's getting out. Now, if Yosef would have, on the last day, if Yosef would have said something to him, on the last day, that'd be okay. But if he says it three days in advance, that means in Yosef's mind, nothing's going to happen in the next two days. Why are you preempting it by two days? You preempted it by two days. You get two years in prison because God goes a day for a year. It's a brilliant answer. That means, this, according to this answer, you're allowed to make yishtal. This guy's leaving prison. You did him a favor. So go and say, what do you call it? You know, do me a favor. Remember me. Well, why do you have to do it two days in advance? Two days in advance means that you, in your own mind, nothing else could happen. God can't get you out some other way in the next two days. Ah, uh, that's your flaw in bitachon. Oh, you had a flaw in bitachon. Therefore, you two more two years in prison. A brilliant answer. I don't remember the source. I don't have written in my notes that I have to find the source. I don't remember. It wasn't my idea. I wish it was. All right. What? Are